the A Day students for tomorrow too, because I won't be able to meet with them because I have a doctor's appointment. So I'm just going to play this recording for them during 4A. All right. Okay, so the question was based on information from previous units, but it was kind of a preview question because there's some stuff that we haven't talked about yet. Um, so in order to make statistical inferences when testing a population, so this is basically the other type of test that we're going to learn about. We learned about confidence intervals. Now this is um, hypothesis testing significance tests. So when we have uh, when we're testing for a population proportion P, we still have to verify the conditions. The only change is uh, number three, where it says instead of N times P, we're going to do N times P null and N times one minus P null. So you'll see what that means when we get into um, the actual test, but we still need to check all three. We check random sample to make sure that we can generalize back to the population. Random assignment to make determinations about cause and effect. The 10% rule to make sure we're independent so we can use those standard error formulas. And then the large counts was for the um, the uh, normal curve. All right. Uh, good morning, Gloria. All right. Um, so if you are taking the AP exam, please watch the new Edpuzzle on calculator functions. I'm going to film it right after this live session and send out my little form. I've already got it put together comparing like the uh, Desmos functions with the calculator functions. All students taking the in-person exam will have access to a TI-84 calculator. If you're taking it online, you can um, check out a calculator from me. I'll make sure to get it to you. The in-person exam is Monday, May 17th at noon, and the online is Thursday, June 10th at 4 p.m. We have our free response tutorial today after school, and I'm sending out the calculator function page and the exam information page after our live session today. All right, here's a quick matching just to remind you about correlation coefficients, so go ahead and give it your best shot. Um, I'll time you for a minute. So you're going to match up the correlation coefficients. I'll give you a minute on the clock. If I can open my phone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, they they come up with what we're going to say for a woman. Not yet, and if I don't hear from them, we're just going to do a reflection survey. So no, uh, no math questions, just questions about like how you think you did as a student this year and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All right, nice job, ladies. Mm hmm. Okay, oh, there's a timer. All right, so looking at, why did I just switch? Okay, hang on. All right, both of you got this, so it looks like um, I'll just do a quick review for the people who are watching the recording. Um, so you should have been able to sort out the positive versus the negative. You've got three positive and three negative, and the negative you can see is going down from left to right. And from there, you can just look based on the strength. So negative 0.99 is very strong because it's close to negative one. Negative 0.3 is closer to zero, so you can see it's more of a, a weaker correlation. And then negative 0.7 is in between the two. 
Uh, 0.9 is a strong positive. 0.5, you can still tell a positive pattern versus zero is just kind of all over the place. All right. And I think, yep. All right, so that's it for the review. I want to go ahead and get into the actual notes. Okay. So we did confidence intervals before. The naming of the confidence intervals was either a one or two sample Z or T interval for a population, proportion, or mean, depending on the different type of test. But we always had the word interval in there. That's how, how we knew it was a confidence interval. This one is now a one sample Z test. So the word interval is replaced with test when we're talking about significance testing. So a one sample Z test for population proportion is a significance test for one sample of proportions. All right, so this we started this at the very beginning of the year, the stating the hypothesis, the null and the alternative. All right, so null is the claim that we weigh evidence against. So if they give us a claim in, in the um, problem, that's our null. We're going to assume that's true. And we're going to try and uh, prove that an alternative is true. So here's our courtroom comparison here. The null is innocent until proven guilty. So we're going to assume the null is true until we prove the alternative. So the alternative is what we're trying to prove with our significance test, right? Um, so when you're writing hypotheses, you always want to refer to P and not P hat because we're referring to the population parameters. The sample just helps us figure out what the population is, but all of our hypotheses have to do with P. So our null hypothesis could be H null is P is equal to 80. And we have two different types of hypotheses, alternative hypotheses. We have two sided and one sided. Two sided is that P is not equal to 0.8. So P could be lower or P could be higher. That's why it's two sided. Here, if we just say that we think that P is less than 0.8, it's one sided. We only think that the true P is less than 0.8. So two things to remember, a not equal to is two sided, and then a greater than or less than is one sided. And we always wanna to refer to P instead of P hat. All right, I'm gonna do these two with you and then you'll have an opportunity to do two more. All right, so according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, 84% of U.S. children had internet access at home as of August 2009. Researchers wonder if this number has changed since then. Notice it didn't tell us what direction. It just says, have it, has it changed? Has it gone down or gone up? So our H null is the claim that we're given. So we want to use P, not P hat, is equal to 0.84. We're going to change that percentage to a proportion. And then our alternative is that it is not equal to 0.84 because we just want to know if it's changed. If it said researchers wonder if this number has gone up, then we would say that P is greater than 0.84. So do we think that our, our alternative is one sided or two sided? Two sided. You got it because of the not equal to. I right, take a look at number two and tell me what you think for the H null. All Thank you, Gloria. P 
is equal to 0.8. I agree because he claims that 80% are very satisfied. We're going to test the claim. It doesn't tell us anything about which way we want to test it. We're, we just want to see if it's true. So if we want to see if it's true, we're going to say P is not equal to 0.8, which would also be two sided. Alright, I'm going to switch the Nearpod over and you're going to have example three and four on the Nearpod. And I'm going to run to the restroom really quick while you guys are working on three and four. What are these tendencies? Black, blue, blue. I'm done. Oh, My hair is so bad. Look at all the times you become the blue. Wow. I got my brother's on too. And then this, my mom did it to me. I teach at high school that I was like, okay, here you go. And he was like, you go to the movie, but. My hair is so bad. Like, I hate it. And hopefully my mom doesn't stay home tomorrow. Let's see what you got. Perfect. All right, Gloria, you got that exactly right. All right, so I'll go ahead and share Gloria's. Let me share it on my screen too. All right, so we said P is equal to 0.10 because that's what the claim says. So we're going to say P is equal to 0.10 on example three. And for the alternative, we'll say P is less than 0.10 because they want to know if it's lower than 10%. Since we have just one side that we're looking for, the alternative is one sided. Same for number four. Our claim is that 75% of teens are getting too little sleep. So we're going to say P is equal to 0.75 because the claim is that it's 75. Um, Ricky thinks that number sounds too high, so he thinks that number should be lower. So the alternative there is P is less than 0.75, and that's also one sided. Perfect. All right. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and go to part two, calculating and interpreting p values. Alright, so what the p value is, is the probability 
of your sample happening if the null is true? The probability of your sample results happening if the null is true. All right, so looking at this, I've got two stories. We don't have time to look at them, but a man in China saved a drowning son and the father of that drowning son 30 years apart. Over here, a 10 year old girl released a red balloon and another 10 year old girl with the same first and last name found it. These are both true stories, but what do you think the probability of these happening are? Very large or very small? Very small. Very small. So these p values would be very, very small, but that doesn't mean that they can't happen. So what the p value is, is the probability of reserving, observing results in your sample as extreme or more um, if we assume the null to be true. So looking back at example one, if I got a sample and my p hat was 0.5, but the true P is 0.84, that would be a pretty crazy result, right? So the odds of getting my sample P hat of 0.5 when the true P is 0.84 would be very low, and that's what the P value represents. The probability of getting this result if this is true. So a low P value means that your P hat is crazy. A high p-value means that your p-hat would be pretty reasonable. So a p-hat that would be reasonable with this might be 0.82 because the true p is 0.84 and that's pretty close. So if my p-hat is pretty close, I would expect a big p-value. All right. So my definition is the probability of getting evidence for the alternative hypothesis as strong or stronger than the observed evidence. And the observed evidence is our sample results. So our P hat, if the null is true. All right, interpreting the P value, we're gonna say assuming the null is true. So assuming that the proportion truly is what we think it is, there is a p-value probability because the p-value essentially is a probability of getting a sample proportion of p hat or more or less by chance in a random sample of size n all this significance test is is just a z-score that's it so it sounds intense but the actual formula is a z-score so normally our z-score formula is value minus mean over standard deviation. So here it's going to be sample minus parameter. So our p hat minus our p over the standard deviation. Now what do you notice about the standard deviation formula? Does it use p hat or p? p? And why do you think it uses p instead of p hat? Because we will already know the sample. Right, we were, and we're testing the sample assuming what is true. The population proportion. Yes, we're assuming that the null population proportion, the claim is true. So if the claim is true, we're going to calculate the mean and the standard deviation using that claim. Remember back to the uh, sampling distributions unit when we said the mean of p hats is equal to p. So our mean is going to be p and our standard deviation is going to use p because we've got to assume that the h null is true because we are innocent until proven guilty. So we're going to assume them to be true and then we use the p hat as our value to calculate where we would be on this normal curve. We have to check these same conditions, the random condition, the large counts. And remember with the large counts, we're using P and I'm going to call that P null because it's the P from the null hypothesis. And then we'll also check the 10% condition. All right, so this is a lot of talking without actually doing, so let me do it. Oh, not doing it yet, sorry. Hey, Samari. All right, let's talk about P values in general, small versus large. 
if we have a small p value, what will we do? Will we reject or fail to reject? Do you guys remember? If we have a small p value. If we don't remember, you can tell me. I want to say we reject it. I agree, you both got it. Yep, we reject. We reject H null because small p values mean that our sample size was crazy or our sample proportion, our p hat was crazy compared to the H null. So if our sample was crazy, then our, uh, our H null probably isn't true. You want my sample and the true population to be close together for it to make sense, right? So we do we have convincing evidence for the alternative with a small p value? Yes, we do. We say the alternative, we can't say that it's true because we don't ever say anything is true in statistics, but we say we have convincing evidence that the alternative is true. If we have large p values, we fail to reject the null. and we do not have convincing evidence for the alternative. So these are the two ways that you would deal with the hypothesis. You don't accept anything. You either reject or fail to reject. And remember, small is compared to the alpha level. So here, if my P is less than the alpha, I have a small P value. If my P is bigger than the alpha, I have a large P value. And the alpha level will change based on the level of comfort of the statisticians running the test. Most people use 0 0.05, but if you want to be very sure, you can use a smaller level. All right, so I have a time to climb on this. That's just four different options for what you should do based on the p value and the alpha level. It's four quick questions, and I think it should jog your memory on the conclusion piece. Yeah. I'm not actually coming on here to ask you a question. I didn't even realize it was a class today. Oh, but no, no problem. This is just a review. Um, okay, you but I was going to say, um, when is the um, AP exam? For online or in person? Um, I actually signed up for in person because I don't think I was going to be able to do it online. Because online it was sometime in June, right? Yep, June 10th. Yep. The in person is May 6th. 17th, so that next Monday. Yep, next Monday. And I'm going to send out an email today with all the information for the in person and the online so you can read through it and let me know if you have any questions. And then I also have an ed puzzle for the calculator piece of it. So I'll send out an email on all that after the review session. OK, and um, so we just go up to the school, right? So. Yep, you go up to the school. It's in the media center. The test starts at noon, so you need to be there by 1130. OK, and I had another question. I'm so sorry. I'm no, don't just... worry about it. No, 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 no. OK, so um, I'll email you in case I remember the question. OK, OK, uh, sounds good. So like... And then hopefully I'll answer the question when I email out information about the exam. I have it. I like put it all together on a Word document. I was just trying to find everything for the in-person and everything for the digital before I sent it out. OK, and the AP exam does not affect our grades. No, not at no. all. Cool, cool, cool. OK, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You stay or? What's that? I said, do I have to stay? Or? Oh, no, no, not at all. This is being recorded. So Gloria and Sarah say and I are just doing practice, and you can watch it later if you want to. OK, thank you, Ms. Lucas. Have a good one. You too. All right, let me pull up.
Oh, you guys are so quick. Hey, Miss Austin. Oh, yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. Of course. Oh, she, I saw she was out. I should have thought about that. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. uh, we find out soon. I I um interview. Okay, um, so look, okay, come back to the live session so we can go over this question together. All right, so we're, we're basically going to do like a full test together, but we'll do it pretty quickly and just kind of check in on remembering the different pieces. All right, so the Shave Room Instagram account reports a study from Gallup that 72% of teens say they seldom argue with their friends. Gloria doubts this and decides to randomly sample 150 BHS students. She finds that 96 out of 150 say they rarely or never argue with their friends. Calculate and interpret a p-value. So first thing is tell me what the H null is and then what the HA is. Uh, the null is 0.72. Okay. And the alternative is 0.64. Ah, I see what you did. Where'd you get the 0.64 from? Uh, 96 of 150 students. Perfect. So what you did, you said 0.64? Yeah. Okay, what you did was calculate the p-hat, which we need later, but remember when we're writing the alternative and the null, you use the same number, just different symbols. So like looking back, we had p is equal to 0.84 or not equal to 0.84. So what do you think about this one? Would it be p is Okay, well if it's 0.64, then 0.72 is greater than that. Right, but does Gloria say which way she doubts it? No. No. So for now, before we even look at the P hat, what should we say the alternative is? Oh, does not equal. Yes. So once you figure out the P, you can write both um, hypotheses with the P. And it all depends on what what claim we're trying to like. I see what you guys are saying with the uh, it being less than and we're going to use that later with the P hat, but or with the P value. But for now, let's just see what we think as far as what the claim is and we're, what we're trying to test. So are we trying to test just not equal to or more than or less than? And all it says is that she doubts this. All right, we'll quickly check the conditions because we've had a ton of practice with this. So do we have a random sample? Yes. yes. Or it says randomly. It's a survey, so I don't need random assignment. I just need random sampling. All right, 10% condition. It doesn't say anything about replacement, so we do need to check this. Her sample size is 150. Is 150 less than 10% of all BHS students? Yeah. 
Yes. Yes, because we're going to assume that Banneker High School has more than 1,500 students, right? It could be pretty close. We could have 1,400. But uh, th it will be very obvious if on the AP exam if you don't need it. So if they don't specifically give you a population, you can assume that um, you'll meet that. All right, with the large counts, tell me, should I be calculating using the P or the P hat? The P? Yes, yes. We need to use the P because we're going to assume the P to be true throughout all this. We only use the P hat once, and that's to calculate the Z score of the P value. But we're going to use P for everything else. So we would do 150 times 0 0.72 and 150 times 0 0.28. I'll say both of those are going to be greater than or equal to 10, so we're good there. All right, calculate the z-score for p hat. That's all this p this whole test is. It's just a z-score, so it seems intimidating, but it's not. So remember, with z-score, we would do value minus mean over standard deviation. But instead of value, we're going to use p hat. And instead of mean, we're going to use p. So what's my p hat? 164. Perfect. Minus my P, which is 0.72. And then I'm going to use the standard deviation formula. And which number should I use in it? The 0.64 or the 0.72? The 0.72. Yep. So I'm going to do 0.72 times 0.28 over 150. And that comes straight from the formula sheet from those sampling distributions. So you can see the square root of P times one minus P over N. So go ahead and plug all that in and let me know what you get. I got negative 2.18. Negative 2.18, let me check. And let me know what you get too, Gloria. I got the same thing. OK, then I won't check. I'll just go with you guys. And that seems reasonable because it's within negative three and three, right? Z scores are between those numbers. All right, now here's the, the part that everybody forgets. Once we calculate the Z score, we need to look back at the alternative and figure out what are we one sided or two sided? So let me know what you guys think. Two sided. We're two sided. So what scenario do you think we're going to be? One, two or three? Three. Yes. All right. So looking at it, I'm going to plug in my Z score in two places because I'm two sided. Negative 2.18 and then I'll just take the absolute value of that and do 2.18. So now we're going to use table A to find the P value. So go ahead and bring up your table A and I can put it in the um, chat too if you don't have it near you. So you can just click on it. And you can look up either one. It doesn't matter which one you look up, 2.18, negative 2.18 or 2.18 does matter how oops, send. okay if you look up the negative 2.18 you should just be able to take the table a value if you look up the positive you're going to have to subtract it from one but you'll get the same answer either way i got a point zero one four six i agree so what that means is that this piece right here is point zero one four six if i looked up the positive 2.18 i get point nine eight five four how are you Deshaun? it's good to see you will you guys subtract that from one and tell me if you get the same number are you here for the senior stuff? I didn't know there was senior stuff. Oh, really? What are you here for? I'm here for AP exam. Oh, what are you doing? Economics. Oh, 
Good luck with that. Yeah, did, that's you already, what I said. did you already take it or is that noon? I can take it today. Oh, good luck. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you for stopping by. All right, when you subtract that from one, what do you get? You get 0.0146. Perfect. So you should get the same thing. So if you looked up the first one right, you automatically know the second one. So my P value is both of them because it's a two sided test. So once you find one of them. You can multiply it by two or you can add them together because it's the same thing, right? Whenever you find one, the other side will automatically be the same. So when you multiply it by two, what do you get? Point zero two nine two. Point zero two nine two. And that's your p-value. If it were a one-sided test, we wouldn't need to multiply it by two. Since it's a two-sided test, we do. So that's the part that everybody gets messed up on. It really depends, like your p-value calculation depends a lot on wh whether or not it's one-sided or two-sided. So since we're two-sided, we multiply by two and we got our p-value. All right, we can use our sentence sim for the interpretation. So I'm flipping back to the last page, and so I'm just gonna write it out. Assuming the proportion of students who seldom fight with their friends is 0.72. So we're saying assuming the true population proportion of students who seldom fight with their friends is 0.72. There is a 0 0.0292 probability of getting a sample proportion of 0.64 just by chance. So looking at this, if our alpha level was 0 0.05, would we reject or fail to reject? Fail to reject. If our alpha level is 0 0.05 and our p value is 0 0.02. Oh, um, reject. We would reject. So if we are rejecting, do we have convincing evidence for the alternative? Yes. Yes. So those two always go together. If we're rejecting, we have convincing evidence for the alternative. If we're failing to reject, we don't have convincing evidence. So your answer will always be yes if you reject and always be no if you fail to reject. All right, now let's try your own oh i think we already went over this all right so the this is all review the four parts of the significance test are the same as the interval state plan do and conclude so with state you're including your hypothesis and your significance level and then you're going to add some context here by defining what the parameter represents plan the same thing you're going to talk about the test name and you're going to check your three conditions. Do is your Z score calculation. You got to find your P hat, your Z score for your P hat, and then look up the P value. And then your conclusions are based on what we just talked about fail to reject or reject. 
And then you've got sentence stems for your conclusion here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and switch it to six on the Nearpod. And the first thing that you're going to do is the state part and the plan part, and then we'll go over that. So you guys just let me know when you want me to look over your um, answers for number six. We're just doing the first two pieces, going to go over it, and then we'll do the do and conclude part.
All right, you guys killed it. All right, perfect job. So I'll just review what you put for the most part. Um, so the state piece is where we actually go through the two hypotheses. You guys got it exactly. The 0.68 and the does not equal 0.68 because it doesn't say that we think it's lower or higher. It just says we want to know if it's true. Um, and then Gloria defined what P was. It was perfect where P is the true population proportion of high school students who have never smoked a cigarette. Um, it says assume a significance level of 0 0.05. So uh, Cher say got that. Alpha is equal to 0 0.05. All right, test we are performing. A one sample Z test. So instead of the word interval, we have to use test because it's a significance test this time. For population proportion. So the letter is still the same. It's a Z test, but this time instead of an interval, it's a test. So one sample Z test for population proportion. You guys checked all these and got them all right. You set it up correctly and you use 0.68 for the large counts condition. Nice job. All right, so I'm going to switch to the next piece of the Nearpod, which is the calculation piece. So this box right here is for you to calculate the P hat, and this box is for you to calculate the Z score of the P hat. But I'm going to leave this page up so you can reference the numbers, and then I'll switch the Nearpod. Nice job, you guys. All right, I switched the Nearpod so you can do your work in there, and but I left up example six on the live session so you can look at the numbers if you need to and the hypotheses.
Beautiful work. You guys got exactly the same numbers. I'll wait for Gloria to finish typing her conclusion and then I will share. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share share saves with you guys. Okay. So she calculated the P hat using the sample uh, results, 90 over 150, which is 0.6. Let me make sure this is showing up on my recording. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, and then you got the Z score of the P hat by just plugging in the P hat and the P and you make sure to use the P for the standard deviation formula. Nice job, you got a Z score of negative 2.1. You knew this was two sided. So once you found the area to the left of negative 2.1, you just use that same number. So 0 0.0179, it's the same for both sides. So you just multiplied by two and you got 0 0.0358. If it were one sided, we would just need to use one and not multiply it by two. Um, Cher said wrote, reject the null for our conclusion, which is absolutely true. If your p-value is small, the null will fall. So you're going to reject the null because your p-value is small. To use this sentence stem, let me go ahead and share my document camera. We would be rejecting the null. I had a quick, uh, a quick typo here. This should say not less under fail to reject, but if we're rejecting. It's because our P value is less than the alpha level, which was true. 0 0.03 was less than 0 0.05. All right, so looking at this because our P value and I'm just going to plug it in right here because our P value of 0 0.03 is less than our significance level of 0 0.05. We reject the null. There is convincing evidence that the true proportion of, and then we'd use context here, we'd say high school students who have never smoked a cigarette is not equal to 0.68, which is the P from the claim. All right, so once you get in, like once you figure out if you're rejecting or failing to reject, the conclusion should be pretty straightforward. We just say which one is smaller, what we're going to do and whether or not there's convincing evidence that the null is not true. All right, great work, you guys. All right, the last little part before I move to the exit ticket is going to be on different types of errors. All right, so I got this fancy chart from the AP statistics book, right? We have two different types of errors, a type one error and a type two error. Um, to me, this is always confusing because there's so many things going on. So an error means we were wrong in our judgment, right? So we have two different types of error. We could reject the null, but the null was true. That's a type one error. We could fail to reject the null, but the alternative is false. That's a type two error. So in order to keep these two errors straight in my mind, I would always be like, okay, is the null true? If the null is true, it's a type one error. If the null is false, it's a type two error. So if we've made an error, we didn't pick the right one. So if the null is true, what did we pick? If we made an error, did we pick the null or the alternative? For a type one, if the null is true and we made an error, which one did we pick? Do we pick the null or the alternative? 
Remember, we made an error. So if the null is true and we messed up, who did we pick? The alternative. Yeah, we picked the alternative. A type two error would be the null is false. But what did we pick? Because we messed up. If the null is false, what was our error here? What did we pick? The null. Yeah, we picked the null. So in my mind, the first thing I think about whenever the question is about type one or type two errors, and I made sure to include one on your exit ticket, is I think, okay, type one means the null is true. Type two means the null is false. And then I back into what the error was. An error means we picked the wrong hypothesis. So type one means the null is true, but we picked the alternative. Type two means the null is false, but we stuck with the null. All right, hopefully that makes sense and we'll do a few quick questions on it. All right. Uh, this first example you can read over whenever you have some time. It just describes a type one and type two error with respect to this context. All right, example seven. Bottles of water have a label stating that the volume is 12 ounces. A consumer group suspects the bottles are underfilled and plans to conduct a test. A type one in this situation would mean what? So first, let's say what the null and the alternative are. So what do you guys think for the null? P is equal to 12 ounces. All right. And I see why you said P because we were doing P this whole time, right? But since it's 12 ounces and not a proportion, here I would say mu is equal to 12, and that gives you a head start on um, significance tests for means. I'm sorry, I should have, I don't know why I used a mean problem. I should have used a P problem. All right, and then what's the alternative if our null is mu is equal to 12? Mu is not equal to 12. It specifically uh, says what? Is less than yep. 12. Perfect. Mu is less than 12. So these are our two hypotheses. It says a type one error in this situation. So if we made a type one error, which one is true? The null or the alternative? The alternative. Let me flip back. A type one error means that which one is true? The null. The null. So if the null is true and we made an error, what did we pick? The alternative. Yep. A type two would be reverse, right? But this is a type one. So let's see what that represents out of here. Which one do you guys think? A, B, or C? And I'll give you a second to read through it. Is it A? Yes. It's A because we concluded that bottles have less than 12 ounces when the mean is actually 12 ounces. So we pick the alternative when the null was actually true. So A is a type one. All right. B would be a type two error. The group does not conclude the bottles have less than 12 ounces when the mean is actually less. That means we stuck with the null when the alternative was true. Does that kind of make sense? Hopefully. All right, now here's a conceptual question for number eight. If the significance level is increased, then the chance of a type one error will what? I want you to think about what that would mean.
And I always, whenever I have conceptual questions like this, I like to plug in numbers and see how it works. So, let's say, Miss Lucas. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. You know how for um, proportions we assume that the significance level is 0 0.05? Yep. Do we do the same for remains? Yes, because in the end, the significance test is calculating a Z score. And so you'll end up doing the same thing. It's just plugging in different numbers. So yeah, you're going to assume that the significance level is 0 0.05 for both. If they don't tell you anything differently. Good question. All right, what would we do here? My p value is 0. 0.6, my alpha is 0. 0.05. Would I reject or fail to reject? Fail to reject. Yep, I would fail to reject. All right, now what if my alpha level went up like the problem says? My alpha level is increased. I increase it to 0. 0.08 but my p value is still the same. What did I what happens now? Do I still fail to reject? No, no. What am I doing this time? Rejecting. rejecting. Yes, I'm rejecting because now with my alpha level going up, my significance level is smaller. So looking at this, it says, what's the chance of a type one error? Well, what's true with a type one error? Is the null true or the alter alternative true? The null. The null is true. So I should stick with the null, but as my alpha level goes up, I'm more likely to reject it, right? So is my chance for a type one error remaining the same, decreasing or increasing? Decreasing. Well, let's see. At first, with the alpha level smaller, I failed to reject. And that was good because the null is true, right? I want to fail to reject. But mm -hmm. as the alpha level went up, I actually rejected. But the null is true. I shouldn't reject it. Right. So, I, so I went actually from no error to a type one error. So what do you think? Increase. Yes. And these questions look simple, but that is a hard question. You have to sit there and think conceptually what's happening as these different numbers go up and down. So it looks easy, but it's not. I just wanted, and we'll do more practice with uh, type one and type two errors with every single packet this unit. So you'll see it again and again. Um, let me go ahead and switch the Nearpod to the exit ticket and I'll put it in the chat as well. All right, and then once you're done with the exit ticket, that's it for today. I'll go ahead and stop the recording, but um, Cher said I'll meet you back here in maybe like 20 minutes. Is that OK to go over it? OK. All right, sounds good. And Gloria, you're welcome to stay if you want to or feel free to drop off. It's up to you, but uh, I put the exit ticket in the chat and it's on the Nearpod right now. So I will see you back here in like 20 minutes.